So IGN released a video this week interviewing Diablo 4 game director Joe Shelley and Diablo GM Rod Ferguson, where they sat down to talk a bit about playtesting during development, the end game beta, and their plans for Diablo as a live service. While a lot of this was kind of broad, unspecific fluff, really, there were a few interesting bits that I wanted to touch on here in today's video. This is probably, I mean, I've been making games for like 22 years now, and D4 is the game that I felt like has been more holistically tested than any other game I've been a part of because it's really part of the philosophy of Blizzard and, and uh, of this team in particular to be able to go in and be able to go, okay, we can play from beginning to end, let's play. Now, what I found interesting here is the way that he spoke about this and he touched on it a few times later in the video as well, really implies that D4 has been in a playable state from start to finish for some length of time now. First, they started by letting members of the dev team bring the game home to test it over the holidays and give their feedback. And then after the dev team, they open it up to all of Blizzard and then all of ABK and then to the friends and family testing, which we know started earlier in the year. And now, which is currently running, being their end game beta. But then he touched on the fact that they've got something next for testing planned. And then we're going to be going into open beta, you know, next year where we're going to be, you know, trying to crush our servers and trying to get as much feedback as we can there. Now, the idea of them having an open beta isn't exactly surprising, but I do believe this is the first time they've officially said they will be having an open beta. At least it's the first time that I've heard official discussion of it. And I think that's absolutely great news. Specifically, the term open beta implies that it won't require any sort of pre-orders in order to play, which is even better. And frankly, at least to some extent, it lends me to believe that they have a fair bit of confidence in their product, in what they're delivering with Diablo 4. Just the fact that they're opening up to the masses assumes that they think it's going to do more good than harm for the sale of their game, which uh, uh, makes me assume that they're pretty comfortable with what they're delivering in terms of a gameplay experience and all of that. We can probably at the same time, though, assume that the open beta, if it is in fact what that ends up being early next year, probably won't have all of the monetization stuff that might end up pushing people away. And it also probably isn't going to be a duration that's going to give people enough time to thoroughly put the game through its paces for the cracks to start to show of any of the uh, longevity issues that the game might have. But regardless, they did also touch a little bit further about um, and talk about the current end game beta testing that's happening right now, why they're doing it, the sort of benefits they're getting from it, and how it's going. This is one of the first times that we've tested, like how to test specifically for the end game. Um, this gives us an opportunity to test the end game systems before we get to launch and then make adjustments and really make sure that when uh, the game comes out, there's some content there that has had some, some testing against it and had some, some adjustments made, so it's, it, they're not um, beta testing it at launch. <laughs> Yes, yes, not beta testing your games at launch. Uh, that is a fantastic idea. How much they're actually able to live up to that has yet to be determined until the game actually releases, of course, and will largely come down to their end game systems, which they did touch on the importance of the end game in D4 as well. Yeah, I mean, Diablo is a systems game, right? That's what we talk about. Like, you know, look at my experience with D3. I played D3 for hundreds of hours, like hun literally hundreds of hours, and I've played the campaign in D3 probably twice. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's the case for my and a lot of other people who played Diablo 3 of the hundreds of hours that I've spent in the game. Uh, yeah, the campaign was played through maybe once or twice. Most of it is engaged in the end game systems and replaying with the seasons specifically. And I think that's the case as well for pretty much anyone who plays most ARPGs, most MMOs, or any live service game in a long term fashion. The main story, the campaign, that ends up being less than like 1% of total playtime because it's all about the character progression, the gearing, clearing of content, that is what delivers those hundreds or thousands of hours of playtime in a game, not the story about how you took on the world ending threat or you saved the city. That is all just window dressing. It isn't the view that you're there for, right? Now, outside of endgame systems at release, the other big thing that's going to play a large role
large role here is, of course, the seasons. This was the case in Diablo 2, Diablo 3, Path of Exile, and many ARPGs. Seasons are where a lot of the long-term replayability does come from because they provide a way to mix things up and keep the game fresh. So let's talk about seasons in Diablo 4. The biggest thing that they discussed in the interview was their approach to seasons. This being like the live service component of the game is promised to be larger in scope and scale than Diablo 3. And it's also just so happens to be the main justification they've used for monetizing the game the way they are. So the first thing they covered was kind of like their rough goal of releasing, trying to release four seasons a year. We've been trying to be a little cagey just because, but when you start that train of now we're a service and people are expecting seasons where you, I think, succeed on players' minds is having consistency to know, oh, every three months there's a new season coming. And so if you go like, well, my ambition is I want to do a little more here. So it's actually going to be three months and three weeks. And then you start to lose that promise to the player and they don't know when to predict or how to think about it. And we, our, our intention is to have a, a heartbeat, is to have a cadence of content that players can rely on and know is both from a season perspective and from an expansion perspective. So I think that's fair. We know that game development can be a bit messy and it can certainly be unpredictable. We see this time and time again with roadmaps and, and planned release schedules of content just not happening the way that developers say they will prior to launch or whenever they lay out their roadmap. And if they are living up to the promise of a live service Diablo game having more substantial updates and more substantial seasons than what we saw in D3, for example, there are probably bound to be some updates where whatever they're planning to add takes a little bit longer than anticipated. Hopefully though, on the flip side, that could also mean that there are some updates that uh, come in a shorter fashion. We'll have to see though, but they're being very purposeful to not set hard deadlines of like four seasons for sure every year, every three months. They're not saying that. They're saying roughly for a year. That is their goal, up to for a year. So with that said, what are their plans for seasons in Diablo 4? How are they gonna look? What are they going to include? Well, the design of D3 three seasons is um, certainly a foundational element for us here. And where we see that going with Diablo 4 is, so it's not just changes that we can do um, to the meta, but also additional features that can come in you know, um, with seasons and really making them change up the gameplay of Diablo in meaningful ways. Um, and exciting ways and having exciting new things to check out every time, so. Okay, so that was really, really vague, like literally zero specifics on what we can expect from seasons other than saying new stuff will come that'll keep it fresh and interesting. Fortunately, however, Blizzard has provided a bit more detail on their live service plans, and this was back during Diablo 4's August quarterly update. They said that seasons play an important role in Diablo's longevity, and as such, they are planning on making the first one available soon after launch and building a dedicated team to bring up to four seasons a year, as we just heard about is just kind of a ballpark figure, with each adding new features, quest lines, enemies, legendary items, and more. They went on to say that Diablo 4 seasons are modeled after those of Diablo 3. When a new season begins, all the characters from the prior season are moved to the Eternal Realm. And then to play the new season, you'll have to create a fresh character, which is like pretty much exactly what they do currently with Diablo 3 seasons, except ideally we're going to be seeing way more new stuff and variety outside of just like some changes to the meta and a couple of gameplay tweaks. So for reference, if you haven't kept up with how D3 seasons work, uh, the most recent Diablo 3 season 27 came with the seasonal theme called Light's Calling, and this introduced basically a new consumable item where you could add like one of three random new class-specific powers to a piece of legendary uh, gear that you have. Then there are seasonal cosmetics, and these were actually, for this season, they're reused from the ones that we got in season 15. And then there's the season journey, which is basically like a season-long checklist of things that you can do, defeat certain bosses on various difficulties, progress these things, unlock these things, and they just give you rewards. Like you can get unlock an extra stash tab or there's the Hadrix gift, which is essentially every season, every class has a full set of free class armor that they can unlock. Then there's also the season conquest and some light balance passing on like certain weapons or armor or sets or legendaries or classes, some adjustments here and there. But yes, of course, we are hoping that seasons in Diablo 4 are more substantial and bring a lot more to the table. And what should we expect? So in the quarterly update, they said that their goal here was to shake 
break the box of D4 with each season, creating unique experiences. And then they broke up into a few sections, diving a little bit further into what this will be. The first section was new content. Each season will be released with a fresh new gameplay feature and quest line that introduces new challenges, mysteries, and possibilities into the level up experience. So very specific wording here that makes it clear that they're aiming for one new gameplay feature and quest line that's not plural with every season they touched on how the quest line will reveal like more of the world story and lore but again i, I don't really care the, the big question for me is what is this new feature that each new season will come with are we talking like entirely new systems like for example we know that the end game activities when diablo 4 launches there's four main things we'll be doing hell tides which are like zone wide events where all the enemies get buffed up and you get special rewards from these special chests nightmare dungeons which are sort of just like hard mode versions of the existing dungeons in the game you bring a key you unlock a hard version you get a new key at the end as well as loot and you keep progressing through harder and harder versions kind of like rifts but different whispers of the dead are essentially bounty quests. You'll have quests throughout the world. You get a special resource. You turn that in for a reward. And then there's the PVP zones, which are known as fields of hatred. That's the thing right now. So we don't know what this new gameplay feature with every season, they didn't, they haven't provided like a ton of detail, but they did touch on it a little bit further on. So they talk about the fact that they want these seasons to refresh the meta. They say Diablo 4 is a vast game. We want to ensure that we're keeping existing content and features in place where they remain fun and challenging to, to participate in. To that end, we will always be evaluating the state of the game to regularly revitalize older stomping grounds. And I absolutely love this idea in general. I want more live service, open world games, more MMOs, more ARPGs to do this kind of thing. Find ways to make lower level zones, bosses, dungeons, uh, and bring them up to the end game to make them vi a viable form of character and gear progression. Like give me a reason to revisit that level 10 dungeon or that early game zone. In fact, that is basically what they're doing with dungeons with the nightmare keys, beefing them up to essentially end game versions. If they can do that as well for zones, as well for various points of interest in the open world if they can do that with open world events that scale to end game or open world bosses lots and lots of potential here but revitalize the entire play space wherever possible but you have to do it in a way that end game players will actually find it worth their time rather than just grinding nightmare dungeons for example then also unsurprisingly they touch on the fact that class balance and tuning will be coming with this seasonal updates they say we will be constantly adding new legendary and unique items paragon boards glyphs and more that will continually refresh the meta and create new build opportunities i think this is also very vital absolutely a must really not only just talking about tuning up the class balance but adding things that mix things up adding new gear pieces or things in the paragon board or the glyphs or whatever make my class have new different ways to play and engage with the different systems and just take on enemies with every season that would be a win in my book they also say that new seasons will come with general game improvements they'll be doing various things based on feedback that they receive the team will look to identify quality of life features and polish work that can be done to improve the overall game experience and invite the community Community to vote upon their priority. Community voting can be kind of hit or miss and can certainly be a double-edged sword in game development. Uh, best of luck here. You kind of just have to hope that the players engaging in this voting are the ones who might know what's best for the game's player base as a whole. By and large, I feel like in a lot of games, the most hardcore player base are pretty self-serving. And I talk about myself in that. Whenever I'm playing a game hardcore, I'm looking to do the things that are going to best attune with the way I'm playing the game. If it is obsessively for 12 hours a day and I'm burning through all the content, I'm going to want things that give me something to do, something to work towards or keep things fresh for me. And that's a bit of a different perspective from the people who might only play five to 10 hours a week. Their pace of progression isn't, uh, they don't have the same concerns. Uh, they're kind of different experiences that you have to try to cater to. Now, of course, you can argue that the people playing the most hardcore, even the casual players will eventually reach that level. And so those hardcore players may have kind of that insight earlier on, but you still have to, of course, consider that a wide portion of your player population 
will not be that most hardcore, that 5 to 1% of the player base who is max level in a couple of days and already <laughs> grinded all of the end game activities after a couple of weeks. That's not everybody. So that's kind of what I mean with the relying on player input, like specifically through surveys to make your decisions. But I, I suspect that's not the only thing. And, and in fact, most of what they'll look at, I'm almost certain, is just going to be the metrics that they have under the hood that we don't have access to. And then there are live events. They have said that each season will come with its own unique live event. An example of a live event might be there's a warning of an impending invasion of Drowned, which may last over the course of a weekend, or maybe there's the arrival of a strange peddler amidst the crags of the dry steps. These events provide gateways to new adventures and unique awards. I think themed public events are great. They add some variety to the world. This touches back on the idea of getting to reuse content that we've already played through. The limited time vendor, I don't, I mean, that's kind of lazy to me, not it's just, it's not very exciting, honestly. The idea that a vendor is going to show up in the dry steps and he's probably going to sell me an items or gears or these specialty resources. Uh, I could take it or leave it if such a thing didn't exist. It's cool. It's fine. I'm just saying it's not, it doesn't get me like pumped up like, ooh, they're going to, there's going to randomly be a vendor in one of the zones. Woohoo. And then of course the season journey, this will be returning for Diablo 4, just like in D3. It is more or less a checklist that you have the season to complete different activities and will reward stuff like in-game cosmetics. Although this time, this time it's also tied into a battle pass. Like Diablo 3, the season journey will be free for all players, they say. Completing season journey objectives also grants progress towards the season pass, a new feature with a battle pass style progression that advances alongside the season journey, enabling players to earn even more rewards just by playing. And this circles us back around to the lovely topic of monetization in Diablo 4. Funding all of this live service content that we've been talking about here in this video is the new monetization model. At least that is the primary justification they've given. We, of course, all know that this is just part and parcel for modern day games, especially live service games, the games that get continuous updates. 99 times out of 100 are looking for a lot more than just a base box price. Now, we've covered all of this in prior videos. We've gone into extensive detail. We know that the monetization will include the following, a base box price you will be paying probably $60 for this game. Maybe they go as low for 50 for like a digital standard edition, but probably $60. Then expansions. Yes, just like Diablo 3 sold Reaper of Souls, Diablo 4 will also sell expansions on top of having a season pass that you can buy every season, which there will be up to four a year, as we touched on, and an in-game cash shop that's going to sell cosmetics. This will include weapon and armor skins, armor for your mount, wings and back adornments, and also pets, quite possibly. They have yet to confirm or deny we might see convenience features as well. They have said uh, <laughs> nonstop, they have drove home the point that it will never be pay for power, but that does not exclude pay for convenience. They've just not brought up that topic as if it doesn't exist, if it, as if it's not possible, or as if they just don't want us complaining about it prior to release. But yeah, pay for convenience might very well happen. This could include things like stash space. They even did that in Diablo 3. Yes, there were stash spots that you could spend money on basically through buying the expansion. Maybe they sell character slots, like you can only have five characters at first. If you want a sixth slot, it's going to cost you some extra money. Maybe they sell currency and resources. Although you could argue that this is pay to win, depending on where the parameters of your definition of that falls. But maybe they don't consider it pay to win. Just like they didn't think Diablo Immortal gems counted as gear. <laughs> <laughs> and then experience boost um, for the characters on the Eternal Realms. And some people might balk, well, that is clearly pay to win. You can make the argument that at launch or at the start of a season, being able to purchase experience boost is certainly pay for acceleration over other players, like pay for power in a way, because you're leveling up faster, you're getting stuff faster, that gives you an advantage in the PvP zones faster, right? You can make that A to B to C kind of transition. I think on the Eternal Realms, after launch, a lot of people probably don't really care. I don't really care if someone picks up the game six months down the road and they buy an experience boost to level up faster on the Eternal Realm. I'll be playing Seasons. I actually don't care what's happening on the Eternal Realm. Do whatever you want over there. Uh, open up RMT for all I care. Like, it really doesn't matter with the kind of game like this, at least how I approach it. My perspective and how I play this game is different, and there may be people who do really care about the Eternal Realms. You know, there's also the whole point of, like, well, if they want new players to level faster, they could just, like, decrease the amount of experience uh, it 
takes to reach max level instead of selling the ability to do that. But they got to find ways to monetize this live service, right? That's, that is, of course, the argument and also their business. They'll make money where they can and without too much of an uproar. So I think the big question for me here is at this moment, we just don't know. Like until the game comes out, we are not sure if all of these new ways to spend money will result in a higher quality, more regular updates that keep the game fresh and interesting longer and whether or not these are more substantial than what we saw in D3 seasons. Time will tell. We will not know until three, six a uh, year after launch. We just won't. And I, I, I'll say too, I think there is a lot of value in this model just at least conceptually but also as it's played out with games I think especially for the most dedicated hardcore players who want to stick with one game for months or years straight nowadays I am more inclined to try a wider variety of games I just enjoy gaming that way more but there were times in my past great examples with World of Warcraft from about 2004 to 2010 that was pretty much the only game I played that entire time maybe I'd pick up something here and there and I'd play for a couple of weeks but for the most part I was just playing WoW nowadays I'll still play WoW with every new expansion but then then I'll put it down after a month or two and I'll check out some of the new releases that just came out or I'll revisit some of the other MMOs that I like like Guild Wars 2 or ESO. Maybe I'll jump back into Destiny or Warframe. Maybe I'll try the new Call of Duty. I'm actually interested in checking out Warzone 2. In general, the point being there's a lot more variety of games that I want to play uh, month in and month out compared to the past and me in the past preferred sticking with one game and the live service model world of warcraft and a lot of mmos with their subscriptions as was the case back when it launched that was very very common nowadays not so much only a few mmos have subscriptions but the idea of paying more than the box price to get regular updates that is very appealing as a mono gamer as someone who likes to just play one game at a time and so for those people uh, this live service trend is probably better in a lot of ways because they've got a game that they love and it is constantly getting updated because it is constantly getting funded. That's just kind of the way it goes. But at the on the flip side of that, nowadays, because I do try more games, a lot of times some of this live service stuff just gets in the way and you have the annoyance of dealing with battle passes on top of that and the kind of the pressure to play into that. It's on me whether or not I fall for that pressure, but it is nevertheless built into the game to try to push you in that direction. E either way, we don't know how that's all gonna play out in D4. Like I said, we'll have to wait until launch. Right now though, we got that end game beta going on. Like we talked about the current expectation is that we are going to be getting some sort of diablo 4 pre-order announcement that will open up later this year probably at or around the game awards and that is also probably likely to come with some form of beta access whether that is early access to the open beta or access to a closed beta prior to the open beta and this is just a discussion video about an unreleased game of course uh, how d4 is going to perform as a live service game will not be determined until after it releases i do think overall it's a great idea even if i'm not in love with all of their monetization plans it does seem as of now to be on the less aggressive side of funding a live service title i've seen just very popular games be way more over the top aggressive and i understand also that the continuous monetization is mostly needed for uh, trying to regularly update a game especially if they do really try to live up to this quarterly consistent fully fleshed out content yeah they probably need something but also don't forget they're gonna be selling expansions as well. On top of the base game, expansions will have to be purchased. This has been confirmed many, many times and has been confirmed even very recently as well. So with that in mind, how substantial exactly can seasons even potentially be if they are also planning to hold presumably the biggest updates and content ads for those expansions that they're selling. Stuff like new classes and new zones, major new features. I have to assume that all of those major things will probably go in the expansions. So how much are we really getting in seasons? Like how much would there be to even add knowing that they're still selling expansions as well? A lot of questions unknown. I make these videos because I think they're interesting topics and they're things that um, I would like answers to. I'm not demanding anything, right? I'm just a YouTuber, don't worry. As much as some people think we don't influence game development, I promise promise you we're just I'm just a dude talking to a camera if Blizzard's making decisions based on the words that come out of my mouth you probably need better people in charge of who's making your decisions don't listen to me I just like talking about games I, I'm no developer but yeah that's uh that's it for today's video it's interesting we will see where they land with the live service stuff there are still a lot of unknowns but they're saying it's going to be big and substantial let's see if they deliver yeah that's it for today thank you for watching hope you enjoyed it see you next time